Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Thank you, and welcome to uh, the May edition of the Gay Games Hong Kong podcast. We're extremely pleased today to have quite a, a good uh, lineup of special guests. Uh, I'm very, very, very happy to have uh, Mary, Steve, and of course, Sean, our Director of Arts and Culture. So I, I guess before we start, uh, obviously, Sean, you've been on the podcast before, and so I think everybody knows you already, but uh, not many people may know of Steve and Mary. So if you guys don't mind, Mary, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, why you are a performer for gay games and what actually are you performing at gay games? Yeah, for sure. So I am a certified inclusive sexologist and I'm working with uh, gay games as a burlesque performer. So I'm a certified uh, mm -hmm. inclusive sex and relationship coach and I practice burlesque as a way of sort of sharing sexual empowerment um, and hopefully like motivating other people and inspiring other people to do the same, although you don't have to do it on the stage. <laughs> you know, you can also incorporate elements of burlesque into everyday life. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. So, and, and your, your performance name is Mary Foxworth. And is that, uh, is that the name that you go by as a sexologist as well? That's exactly right. I decided to stick with my name. I know a lot of performers take on um, different names, but because I see burlesque as an extension of my own sort of sexual power, I thought I'm just going to keep it <laughs> um, as myself because, because it is me um, and it is an extension of myself creatively. So I don't have that separation. Thank you. We're going to have a lot of questions about burlesque dancing itself, so you know, let us come back to that. Um, but first, I want to move on to Steve. Steve Imre, uh, you are. I know that you're you're with the Hong Kong Gay Men's Choir. Can you tell us a little bit more what you do with them and uh, how the the choir was formed? Sure, sure, sure. I put my top on special so that you could see. Uh, so I'm the chairman of the Hong Kong Gay Men's Chorus and have been for, I think about three years, almost four, almost four years. So we were created by myself and kind of my two best friends uh, who are no longer in Hong Kong, unfortunately. But uh, we wanted to create a space that was purely for gay men to sing. So we all three of us had been in choirs within Hong Kong and there was an element of LGBT and there was an element of LGBT allies all happily mixed together, but there wasn't a predominantly gay male singing choir. And so we decided to take it upon ourselves to, to make it. And we decided that the choir would be purely, well, not purely pop music, but music that would be 99% loved by everyone wherever they were. So we sing kind of everyday British, well, not British, um, English spoken pop music. <clears throat> and um, we've had quite a success, which is quite nice. So you mentioned allies, but the, the name of the mm. group is the Hong Kong Gay Men's Chorus. So how does that work? So if a straight man wanted to join, w would he be allowed? No, sorry. What I meant was that um, me and my three best friends had been uh, performing in LGBT based choirs that had a certain amount of allies in them. So we created a brand new choir that was purely gay male chorus. But in actual fact, we have had that happen. Uh, a straight male join our choir and um, he'd found us on Instagram and, and loved what we were doing and really, really, really wanted to join us. And whenever I get someone coming forward because i i do on a semi-regular basis asking if they could join i do ask you know are you an out and proud gay man to which everyone always says yes and then <laughs> the poor man was being I, I think he was asked out on a date by one of our members and i felt slightly uncomfortable and then came to me saying that he was actually he wasn't he wasn't gay <laughs> and he just wanted to sing songs so um we kind of had to let him let him move to a different choir that is LGBT and their allies so that everyone could feel comfortable, not just him, but our members as well. 
Um, yeah, so we did have that happen. It was fine though. So th this could be a very ignorant question, but uh, are there, um, uh, is there a, a choral advantage to keeping it to just men? Or, or you know, would you would would it make difference if uh, make a difference if you, if you added lesbians, for example, or, or or you know other genders? No, 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 no. Um, I think the thing with it being men is that most cities, most cities around the globe have a very large gay male chorus, and they're very very successful. Uh, San Francisco. Um, Washington, um, London, Sydney, they all have these big gay men's chorus, you know, up to 70 men singing. And um, that's what we wanted to try and start creating. Um, when we did start the choir, there was a shout out from um, a few lesbians in the, um, in the community asking why, why, why there was not one for them. And our answer was purely make it. There's nothing to stop you from collecting a nice. Go so start your own <laughs> lesbian singers and start. Like we we didn't do anything special. Just three people got together and said we'd like to sing together, and that's 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 just what we did. Um. So no, I think the 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 joy of the men singing together. It's kind of very traditional in Britain that you know you have these Welsh male voice choirs, and they are some of the best in the world. So uh, I, I have that to live up to as well. Mm, interesting. So, yeah. so Sean, uh, obviously, uh, thanks, Steve. And, and obviously, Sean, you've invited both Mary and, and Steve's chorus to join as performers for the Gay Games. Can you kind of walk us through a little bit? Uh, obviously, you've got a very strong lineup of performers now, both in events leading up to November and in November during the Gay Games as well. What are your selection criteria for the performers that you choose to partner with? And how do you go about uh, uh, approaching them and bringing them into the gay games experience? Well, I would say that um, uh, a criteria for ours is, is obviously um, performance diversity, the diverseness. So we wanna have a really well-rounded representation of everybody that, that does any kind of performance activities in Hong Kong, whether that be vocal work, dancing, performance, um, choir, opera, classical music, instrumental. So it's it's great for us to have a, a well-rounded approach in terms of the, the kinds of acts that we're approaching, as well as acts that we think are going to resonate with the local audience. So we're mostly sticking with acts that are regionally based. Um, that both was sort of born from uh, knowing what what is an interest level of the local community, as well as what would best represent the local community. Um, and also uh, just with coming freshly out of the, the pandemic, it was what we were able to, uh, to best uh, utilize in terms of uh, the, the ease of getting performers that were in the area that could perform. So um, <clears throat> just sort of uh, being able to, to sort of represent the sort of world-class entertainment that Hong Kong has to offer and uh, do that in a way that is sort of a, a variety of, um, of talent. So I want to go back to Mary because I, I'm, I'm super curious about burlesque dancing. Um, I, I think many of us have seen the, the Cher movie, uh, but for those of us that haven't, can you, can you explain what burlesque dancing is? Oh, burlesque is amazing. Burlesque dancing is a performance art um, and it's a type of dance that celebrates uh, sexual empowerment, but it's also extremely creative. So one person's performance, maybe objectively or subjectively, you might not think that there is a sexual undertone because every burlesque routine is so unique to the, the performer themselves. And that's what I love about it. So burlesque dancing as well, fantastic because it's super inclusive it's not elitist at all there's no rules it's not like other times of at uh, times types of uh, performance um performance mediums or or types of dance where like there's definitely serious technique involved especially to be able to be on a stage um not that i'm saying that i don't have technique <laughs> i think i have enough to be able to get on I'm stage i'm sure you do 
<laughs> but part of the fun is that there are no rules. So it's really about that sexual creative expression. And also there are really not many other forums where this is so celebrated. Um, I certainly, you know, struggle to think of other areas where people can get up on a stage and celebrate what makes their sexuality unique in a fun, safe, creative way. So that's what I really love about burlesque. Um, it's for everyone. It's for all bodies. It's for all shapes, sizes, abilities. And I think that that diversity is what makes it so special. And uh, I'd really love to see more of that diversity myself. So I think in Hong Kong, um, it's emerging. Um, I like to think that it's growing. But what's also special about being involved in burlesque now is that it's something that is, you know, incredibly unique um, and it's growing. So it can only be, you know, as special as um, the performers, you know, themselves who are willing to get up on the stage. And and I'd love to see, yeah, more people embracing it. Hmm. Now, now this is an art form that's that's still fairly new to a lot of people in Asia, um, and uh, yeah. you also described yourself as a sexologist, right? So uh, I'm sure we all would would agree that I think in most parts of Asia there are still some very conservative attitudes towards uh, celebration or expression of uh, of of sex or sexiness. Um, how do you how do you use your art form to push the push those envelopes? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think honestly, just by getting up on stage, I'm already pushing an envelope. Like, because we're not, we don't see diversity in expressions of sexuality. I think in Asia, it is quite limited that, you know, simply by, you know, having the guts to get up on stage and, and express yourself, you know, that, that is pushing the boundary. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, pushing boundaries, hmm. <laughs> I don't do any challenging stereotypes. Yeah. yeah. Challenging stereotypes. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I think that there is, there is a lot to challenge when we think about what it means to be sexual today and to express that. And so seeing someone actually put it really in front of an audience and to say, I am confident with who I am, I am confident with my body, that is pushing a boundary or that is challenging, you know, so much of what we're, what we're fed and what we're taught about, about our bodies um, and shame and sexual shame. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's amazing to sort of see that this is something that is growing, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and, and, and speaking of pushing envelopes um steve you you've yeah. uh, obviously you 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 you're also based in asia and you also perform in asia and hong kong yeah what, what has been the common reaction to to or from audiences when they know that okay this is a, a a chorus that's completely uh you know a group of out and proud gay men yeah. do they do, are they taking it back are they surprised or do they just kind of take it in stride and it doesn't matter no, I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters at all. Um, I one of our one of our favorite things that has ever happened to us regarding kind of being very out and proud and open about our singing and and us as men, um, we regularly perform at the Kowloon Union Church in Jordan. Oh wow! Okay. Um, Maggie, who's this wonderful Scottish pastor there, um allows us to put up all of our pride flags all over the church. And so when you walk in at Christmas time or summertime, rather than seeing Jesus on the cross, we've got a great big pride flag hanging, hanging up behind us. And I think the, the, the bigger thing is that our audience members who are our friends, our family, quite a lot of them gay, or LGBTQ, um, they're kind of more surprised and pleased that there are that they're seeing that they're seeing pride flags up in a church. That's that's kind of the push that that we are able to do because 
otherwise we're just singing uh, you know the, there's mm. there's no there's nothing horrible happening there it is just singing but for them seeing us waving pride flags hanging pride flags and and for the pastor to to welcome them into the church and and be so happy that they're there. They, they, they just think it's like, I. we've had people come up and say, I've never been in a church where I've seen a pride flag hanging up. That would never happen, you know, at their home, in, in whatever country they're from, especially the state of the world in certain places, they would never see it. And, and this really kind of um, pushes their belief in, in the church. <laughs> also and 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 just what can be done in certain places mm. that's, that's it's almost like an education process for them yeah it's an education yeah. for them as well isn't it yes i want to um, i want to ask you a question about your your repertoire you mentioned mm. uh you've chosen to sing predominantly pop um yes uh is it uh, any kind of pop or do you focus more on uh, I, I guess handbag pop. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but you know a lot of like gay handbag. men's uh, handbag uh, oh. pop. You know, M Dancing Madonna, Cher. <laughs> oh, um, no, no, not really. Actually, no. Um, so we do sing predominantly uh, kind of Western pop, but we have done smaller pieces in in Cantonese. And some of our um, uh, Thai and Filipino members have sang also in, in, in their native languages. We, yeah, predominantly in English, but it's not really handbag pop. I think we've done one, one Kylie Minogue. Oh, maybe two, maybe two. <laughs> um, but it's more so we've tried to choose things that mean something, that, they, that there is a little bit of... Um, meaning to the language to the words so the one song that we have done forever and is kind of our finale our encore is proud by uh, heather heather small who used to be part of m people in the 90s in britain and, it, and it's just asking the question what have you done today to make yourself feel proud and it's just really we sing it out to the the audience to ask them what have you done right that, that's made you feel happy, proud, an achievement. Um, and that, that's when we get the rainbow flags out. And that's, that's a big one. Um, other ones that we have done, for example, this season we're doing um, Running Up That Hill and Edge of Glory because we wanted to have a little bit of a gay gamesy kind of achievement kind of vibe. Um, we were thinking about a bit of Tina because Tina Turner and the gay games originally. So we were looking into that. Um, but really it's kind of just anything that the musical director loves. For example, he's, he doesn't do a lot of spice girls. He's not a big fan, <laughs> but anything that can be nicely arranged into three or four parts is good. Um, what else? We try and do some things that are a cappella without music. So we've got a lovely mm. arrangement of um, Africa, which mm. is, is great. We really enjoy singing that. Or we try, by and, Toto. you know, kind of just, yeah, by Toto, it's, it's a fantastic, yeah, fantastic version. Or other ones that just people can get up on their feet and dance to, uh, just can't get enough. For example, we do, and um, we did last year, which was, which was really good. Um, everyone was in the aisles at the church dancing. So for me, when I started the choir, the, the big question was, what would some audiences like to hear? So I spoke to Petticoat Lane and FLM and mm. I think Sean as well, a couple me of things. Sir. What what would you as an audience member like? Because there are other choirs singing classical music, musical songs. There's Filipino choirs. There's... Um, Lots, lots of Sicilian singers doing very highbrow four, five, six part harmonies. We just didn't want to do that. We wanted something that was um, accept, um, manageable by us, but also enjoyed by the masses, really. And, and of course, for, for those that don't know, Petticoat Lane and FLM are, are two of the, uh, the gay clubs in Hong Kong. Um, what about village people? Do you do any village people? 
Just curious. Um, no, no, no. We I, I, did village people originally do go west? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. We are well. Yes, no, they did. I don't think we. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they will. There we go. So we are doing go west. Yeah, we've been doing go west a while. It's even got dance moves. It's kind Ooh. of. Um, but <laughs> upsettingly, it's the one with the worst words. We can't remember them at all. <laughs> but what we do, we love. We we do love it. We we know it on the night. We know it on the night. But before the night, it's always a little bit touch and go with go west. But it's it is it is a fave. We do yeah have a little bit of dancing as well. Interesting, interesting. And what about you, Mary? What 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 songs do you dance to? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I well, I like to think of myself as neo burlesque. So that kind of there's like different types of burlesque that you can do. You could do showgirl burlesque. You know, you could go off script and do your own thing. I'm neo burlesque because I choose a range of songs that kind of suit my feeling. <laughs> And I'm typically sticking to more um, of a vintage style. So I go for retro songs um, because I think that that also kind of enhances the femininity that I bring to the stage. Um, but yeah, I might mix it up. We, we did a, there was a World Pride event earlier this year and a lot of, there are a lot of Aussies in the, in the crowd. It was supported by Gay Games and I did a performance there. So I made sure to choose Aussie songs. <laughs> So I started with the vintage one um, that was quite retro. And then I moved into I Touch Myself by the Divinals, classic Aussie banger. Anyway, yeah, so, so I can mix it up. But definitely I'm going for like quite a feminine, feminine vibe. So I prefer to dance to a woman singing. Interesting. So no Kylie for you either. I mean, I could do. She's Aussie. <laughs> if I ever do another event with lots of Aussies in the crowd, <laughs> I'd love it. I think I think we will, right? Because Sean, don't we have Courtney act in our in our concert as well? So yes. we know that uh, there's a lot of Australians that are coming oh, to Hong Kong. Amazing to be there. <laughs> Courtney act is amazing. Yeah, she's she's a legend. So so Sean, how did we score Courtney? What what was that process like? Um, well, that how was that process? Like it was, it was basically um, we knew that um, that she was she was coming through Hong Kong. She's come through Hong Kong a few times, so she's done a few regular performances at a few clubs here before, and so we knew that Hong Kong was an area that she'd been to before. And also, she's relatively she's she's globally known, but she's also relatively nearby in Australia. So um, those were two really big deciding factors. And also we, um, we just have a, a really strong um, Australian base uh, in the region that are very interested in gay games. So it was kind of, um, it was sort of a, a real no brainer choice for us to select, <laughs> for us to select her as one of our headliners. And we're, we're incredibly excited, especially since she's just coming off of um, being one of the hosts for Sydney World Pride. So uh, it, was, it was an incredible year to, to manage to, uh, to get her on board. We're incredibly happy and pleased. Yeah, yeah. I saw her in Sydney. She was she was amazing. She's she's such a such an amazing performer with with a great stage presence. So uh, we're, we're all very excited to have her here. And I know, of course, that you've got a lot of other very very um, impressive performers as well. So how do you kind of fit all of the different genres into? I know that we've got three nights of performances, what is the programming decision that you need to make to kind of like fit the genres together? Is it kind of like a jigsaw puzzle? How does it work? It's a little bit. We, we try to organize each night in terms of what we think would attract the, the groups of people who will enjoy those types of activities. So uh, we have one night that is more dedicated towards, um, towards international pop music. We also have one night that's more focused on uh, local pop music. So anything that is either locally based artists or artists that perform uh, prefer to perform in Cantonese will be on that night. And then we also have one night that's a bit more focused towards what we call classical music or classical performances. That would be any of your um, your orchestra, contemporary dance, ballet, those those types of performances would be on that night. 
So we try, we do try to segment it. We, we mix it up a little bit just because we don't want it to be all one note. We also mm. understand that some performers have, um, have uh, time constraints that make them, uh, they'll need to perform on certain nights. So we accommodate for that. But for the most part, we do try to, to curate it in a way that um, does make sense with, uh, with different audiences. And what will, um, what, what will uh, best uh, pique their interests for the night. And and beyond the three nights of concerts, do you, and, and I know that you're still in the planning stages, but is there anything you can tell us about some of the other parties, the after parties or some of the other events around Hong Kong around that time and how, what sort of genres of, or, or types of performers do you think we should expect? Well, you can you can definitely expect um, some cabaret and burlesque. We are very close with the the local cabaret and burlesque um, performers, and as well as uh, drag queens, uh, drag kings, um, and a lot of um, of different uh, more local acts that are sort of more um, the the smaller band type of performances. We have those at various partner um, uh, partner locations all throughout the city. So uh, there will be definitely. Um, a variety of acts you'll be able to find any type of performance that that you're interested in looking for um we also do have two very talented performers who are going to be joining us from the uk who do a um they do a, a sort of a dialogue based on uh, sort of the the situation that they are performing in so they will be doing um a, one of these dialogue performances or dialogue uh, uh activities as well during the week so uh, we're very excited for uh, for all these different um, different types of uh, opportunities that we can offer the people uh, coming to Hong Kong. That that's great, and and uh, <clears throat> I guess Mary, you, you're performing in the gay games kind of uh, framework as well. What are what would be some of the the messages that you want to send through your performance specifically to the gay games participants, whether they're sports participants or or just supporters what what would you want your your performance to convey to those people it's a good question david it's a good question i hope that when people see uh, my performance and we have another burlesque performer um on friday mona montague i hope that people when they see us they feel the same sort of, I guess, celebration and, and I guess Pride. uniqueness. Yeah, diversity around how sexuality can be expressed. Um, because when Mona performs, she's very different to me. So we are bringing diverse acts to the table about what it means to be a woman, what kind of stories we have to share. So really when people see me, I want them to see that, you know, it's not a, there's no one way of being sexually empowered. Um, I feel like the fact that I'm getting on stage is, <laughs> is something, <laughs> but there are so many different ways that women and anyone can tell, can tell their stories on stage around, you know, their sexual empowerment, and share their creativity in that way. Um, yeah, I hope that people will have fun and people will see mm. that feminine sexuality is something that can be very powerful, uh, that isn't something that should be shameful, um, that is definitely a positive thing. And I really want to bring that kind of spirit of, uh, you know, as I say, like sexual empowerment um, and mm -hmm. and inclusivity to to the gay games community which i know already exists but i think that it's quite special to kind of see it celebrated in such a bold bold way <laughs> um yeah, yeah so yeah. there's lots there's lots that you hope people take away i guess that also the foundation is is respect you know you want people to see that this is something that is is there to also be celebrated and and respected um that mm. that it's something that I do consensually and willingly and I have fun and that it's okay to have fun and to express yourself sexually, that this is a real this can be a really positive thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think one one thing that people might need to be educated on <clears throat> is the difference between what you what you are trying to teach us about 
self-empowerment, celebrating your own sexuality, owning it, uh, being proud and unique. But I think there may be, uh, you know, maybe people who, who are very new to this that might say, well, aren't you just sexualizing your own gender? Uh, are, you, are you sending the wrong message to people? What is the difference between what you do, the celebration of sexuality that you do, versus what people sometimes think, oh, you know, isn't this just something that's exploiting your own body? Can, can you just kind of like talk about that a little bit? What is, what, is the, what is that nuance that we need to understand? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And it's something that, you know, as you say, it is about education. So there's only so much that I can hope you know, people will take away from seeing burlesque um, in terms of thinking about, you know, how they how they perceive it, perceive it. But ultimately, I think that burlesque is something that is unique and powerful. And it's my responsibility as a burlesque performer to show that this is something for everyone. It's not just for me, but also that I am having fun and I'm confident and that it's okay and I'm having a good time. I can't be too responsible for <laughs> how it's received by other people because I can't control that. So that's that's the kind of the gray area that I find myself in in that I take responsibility as a sexologist and an educator to educate where I can. But because of the culture that we live in, it's very difficult for me to try and help people make that connection immediately when it, it sits with that, with that individual. It's so subjective. And there are so many experiences that people have around their bodies and their sexuality that influence that thought process that again, you know, yes, education is one way to look at that, you know, how, how these thoughts come about, how people feel about themselves, um, and how they experience other people's, you know, experiences of sexuality, like with burlesque. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's, that's a whole yeah, kill yeah. of fish, David. <laughs> exactly. But exactly. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it's a personal yeah. journey, right? It's, it's, it's a very personal yeah. journey that each person has to kind of like experience. Um, and exactly. you cannot be responsible. Yeah. And, and it is something that's, you know, it's with the individual and it's also with our culture. How does our culture receive burlesque dancing as an art form? How do we talk about it? Where's, what's the language that we use? How do we respect it? I think all of this kind of fits into the way that individuals will experience it. And hopefully one day we'll make a positive connection. Um, but yeah, I think it's all about how the burlesque performer feels when they perform and, and why mm -hmm. they choose to do what they do um and obviously if it's consensual and they're willing and they're having a good time then i would hope that anyone who's watching it and receiving that experience is only going to take away something positive from that and not see it as something that's shameful yeah and i think the other part of this that's that's particularly important for uh, the gay community perhaps is what you um want to teach us or preach about celebrating all different body sizes or, you know, no, yeah. nobody is, nobody should be shamed for the shape of their bodies. Right. And this is something that, you know, yeah. in, in our community, we seem to grapple with uh, a lot. So you're, you're actually sending a very powerful message. Um, and I think this is something that we need more of in our community. So I, I think it's great that you do what you do. Thanks, David. I try. And my body's not perfect in any way. <laughs> and I think like, actually, um, you know, all bodies should be celebrated, you know, as sexual, you know, kind of, not, I was going to say sexual objects, not sexual objects, but as, you know, sexual human beings, everybody deserves that respect. Everybody deserves to be worshipped and to be loved and to be celebrated. And the more kind of diversity that we see of these bodies, the more that, you know, we can see this as being a positive thing. But yeah, I know that there are so many different reasons why, why bodies are, you know, why we treat different bodies differently. But burlesque is one yeah. way that we, hopefully we can kind of celebrate all of them. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, and I obviously want to, 
ask the same question of Steve as well. Not that every performance needs to have a message, but uh, imagine if you are performing at the gay games, mm -hmm. what would you want people to walk away from your performance with? Uh, is, there, is, is there a message? Is there a lesson? Or do you just want everybody to have a good time? Yeah, probably a bit more of the latter, but um, I think the thing with 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 choirs and choral music and and singing is that it's really part of all of our lives all the time. If you consider birthdays, mm. Christmas celebrations, we sing, and people have such a joyful time when they sing. Um, for me, I I would love it because. Say you say you've been along to your your sport at the gay games and you've you've lost or you've you know you've not come out on top. Hopefully, then if they can come to the arts and culture events, the choirs, and just sit back and enjoy, I think it it helps raise people's positive mood, their spirit. You know, it just it 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 allows them to kind of forget what was worrying them, enjoy what they're listening to, join in if they want to, and just come away thinking, wow, I, I you know, for the last half an hour, I've, I've, I've kind of lost myself in song. Um, and that's what we try and say to some of our boys as well. You know, if, you, if you're having a bad day and we've got rehearsal on a Thursday night, it's kind of the best medicine that you could ever hope for. Rather than going home and being a bit moody and curling up in bed, why don't you come and sing for an hour? And it'll probably change your change your spirit. So I think it's the same thing for the gay games. Yes, come and enjoy and appreciate the music, but hopefully it will lift your spirits at the same time. I, I don't think I've seen anyone come out of one of our concerts yet in a bad mood. So it would Do you encourage that, audience participation as well? Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's a big, 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 big part. Sean knows it's a big part of our um, repertoire. So what we um, what we try and do is we we have a wonderful musical director called Ewan, and he is a primary school teacher. And basically, he teaches it, it. He treats us and the audience as a primary school class. So everything everything <laughs> is relatively easy for us to manage. And he puts together an audience participation sing-along at the end. And so I think last summer when we did our Pride concert, it was kind of duets, you know, so it was, um, uh, I can't remember, what, like Aladdin, it was uh, oh. Shallow. Um, and, and, and he gets everyone standing up. He gets, you know, get on your feet and this half you're going to sing the first part, you're on the second part, oh. and away we go. And we as we as boys join the audience in that part because sometimes we've only seen that music for about a week. So we just, again, just get in the audience and get people up. And the same at Christmas. So we, we don't sing any secular songs, that are, or is it non-secular? I can't remember. Um, we don't sing any kind of Christian-based, Bible-based songs. You don't sing hymns. We do. Yeah, we don't sing hymns. That's the word I'm looking for. We don't sing hymns. But at the at the end, we will sing the more traditional Christmas songs. So maybe, oh, you've lost someone. Maybe we'll have done um, Underneath the Christmas Tree in the middle of the, the, sh the Christmas concert, which is one of our favorites. But by the end, we'll be singing We Wish You a Merry Christmas as a group with the audience. So hopefully we will do that at the gay games as well in November. And who knows, we might have a full choir of 6,000 people standing watching, singing along to something if the screens are big enough. I think that would be a really good takeaway. I would I would love that, that would be brilliant. Um, that would be just, amazing. It just makes you happy and it gets little tingles down your spine and you're, you know, you're really pleased with it. So yeah, we, we fully encourage audience participation. And dancing. And dancing. So for, for those of us who yeah, cannot yeah. wait into no November, where can we catch your performances? What's your schedule for the rest of the year? Sure. Um, so we have, I'm going to say two, maybe three concerts in uh, June. So I'm speaking to the lovely Sean about something for June. We've got um, a 
concert at the Music Room in the Eaton Hotel on the 22nd, which is really special to us because the 22nd of June is our birthday. And the first place we ever met and sang in was the Music Room in the Eaton Hotel. So we're working wow. with them to do something on there. And then for the first time, we're singing at the Lewis Koo Cinema in the Hong Kong Art Center on the 15th of June. So mm. that's kind of our biggest, biggest one yet. We've got a good, I would, I would say about a, a good, almost 90 minutes worth of singing for that night. And, and um, that's kind of our big uh, June one. Then we have our summer break and then we're back just rearing to go for the, the K Games. Terrific, terrific. Yeah. Wow, and Christmas, of course. And we have, uh, we're on YouTube, we'll go look there. Oh yeah, I'm definitely going on YouTube after this <laughs> and checking you guys out. Um, is there. Is there. Uh, you've got a very important show coming. Uh, how yeah. are you preparing for that? And, and where can we catch you? And where can we buy tickets? <laughs> Ah, all good questions. So I'm preparing for it by today. I decided on my costumes um, and I've been putting together a routine for, a, uh, actually I'm going to do two different performances. So, but one of my performances has kind of two acts within it. So I'm preparing for it in a number of ways because I have made it, I've given myself a challenge. <laughs> I give myself a challenge to try a few different things. Um, so I just do, you know, um, rehearsal time, really testing out my costumes um, and making sure that I'm comfortable with the songs, um, hair and makeup, making sure I got all my bits and bobs together. Um, and I'm performing for a Femme Pride event this Friday at Petticoat Lane, which I am super excited about because Femme Pride is what burlesque is really all about. <laughs> It does not get more femme pride than burlesque. So I feel like the two were meant to be together. Um, and also, I'm just super excited to perform for the audience. You know, this is an event that is about femme, femme pride, femme empowerment. Um, and burlesque is so inclusive and it's all about it. So so it will be, um, well, actually, there's a couple of things happening on, on Friday. So there's a kind of like a tea dance from three o'clock. And then this event, I think it should start from eight. Um, and it will be me. It will be one other burlesque performer, Mona Montague. And it will be Vita Starkin, who will be doing cabaret. So it is an amazing lineup, David. Don't miss out. You can get tickets um, on Eventbrite or you can get tickets at the door. Sounds good. Eventbrite or tickets at the door. So we, we only have time for one last question. And, uh, I, you know, I, I just want to ask each of you, um, Steve, um, for the people that are still deciding if they want to come to Hong Kong and, and be a part of the gay games, uh, what, what, what would you say to them uh, to help them decide? Obviously, we've got the sport events, but uh, what, what, why should they come and watch performances by the chorus and other performers? Yeah, I am. Um, actually, I had this conversation with a couple of people um, this week. I have um, some friends in Australia, Kuala Lumpur and Guangzhou, all of whom were humming and hawing about what to do, whether to come. And um, firstly, I think for those people that have not been in Hong Kong for such a long time that maybe are missing their friends and family here, it's a wonderful opportunity to combine a number of things together. You know, you a trip as well as this wonderful world stage of events. I think that's a great thing. Um, I think there's a lot of people that have missed what's possibly been going on for three years in Hong Kong. It's changed dramatically. It's a nice chance to kind of dip their feet back into Asia and see what's going on here. Um, if they're sporty, if they're arty, there's something for everyone. I know because... I'm working with Sean on the arts side of things. There's so much going on for people to really come in and enjoy. You know, I think um, there's been such, I, I don't want to say bad press, negativity, maybe un, undue bad thoughts about this area that I think they should come in and see for themselves and really, really experience what 
what Asia and Hong Kong have to offer. And so the gay games is a lovely way into it. That's what I'm trying to Sounds tell my good. friends. Sounds good. Sounds good. Mary, what about you? What do you want to say to, to the people that are still on the fence about whether they want to come to Hong Kong for the games? What do you want to say to them? Oh, well, they have to come. I mean, it's so amazing that this is the first time that Asia is hosting gay games and Hong Kong is hosting it. And I've lived here for eight years and I really love this city. It's incredible. It is still so spectacular and special. You get I mean, I live in Moiwo, so I'm basically in the jungle. <laughs> but you can have jungle, you can have city all in a day. It's just, it's just honestly sensational. And obviously the community is so special. And to be a part of this community at this time, um, it's, yeah, once in a lifetime really. So I would encourage everyone to not only think about, like, how special Hong Kong is and, and will always be, but how special this event is and what it means for the LGBTQIA community uh, in Hong Kong as well and in Asia. It's just incredible that that we are hosting it. That's wonderful. Th thanks for that. And, and of course, Sean, you get the last word. Uh, in your role as Director of Arts and Culture, why should people come to Hong Kong? Well, I think that people should come to Hong Kong to experience what it truly is like to be in Asia's world city. I think that um, really what what we're putting together really showcases uh, the the true melting pot of Hong Kong, how um, really everyone who is here, local or uh, expat immigrant, um, ev everybody comes together to sort of uh, bring their own stories to the table and really create a, a unique experience that uh, that's that can be showcased to a world stage now. Um, and, and in addition to that, it's not just the performers. We're also doing a number of visual arts uh, exhibitions across the city as well for the arts and culture program. So you're going to see um, the input from voices from all over the region in a variety of different mediums that uh, I think is going to be very um, eye-opening and uh, immersive for people that are coming to experience what we're all about. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a really truly unique experience um the likes of i think asia has has not seen yet uh in, in within the lgbtq space so i think this is something that everyone should look forward to and uh make sure they register now and get those tickets in right um and so i hope everybody uh, uh hears you and understands uh, what, what you're saying so with that i want to say thank you so much mary uh, steve and sean uh, thank you for your time today. You, you are truly inspiring everything that you do, and and I and I feel that uh, what we've learned uh, on on the show today about what you do and the message and the the lessons that you're trying to to send out, I think these these are very important things that people need to learn. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>